Hey everyone, this is Teresa from Base 10 Montessori, and today I wanted to do a very special topic that I feel very passionate about, and that is Montessori versus special education. What's the difference? Because there are a lot of opinions about Montessori, and there's a lot of misconceptions about Montessori, and we seem to be um, lumped together a lot of times with special education, and I wanted to kind of show you the differences between what Montessori does and what special education does. So that way, if you have a child with a learning disability or that they're not doing well in public school and you're thinking Montessori might just be the ticket, I've heard that it works for a lot of children with disabilities. I just want to give you the information real quick to show you, first of all, what the differences are. And if you're an educator out there, whether you're Montessori trained, special ed trained, or any other type of trained, I really want to go over some of the specific specifics of what I've learned throughout my career and what I've been learning, learning currently about Montessori and special education together so that you have a better understanding of what's going on in my classroom. You know, if you're Montessori trained and you don't have any special education background, you might um, be feeling a lot of pressure. You might be feeling confused about what is it that you're supposed to be able to do? Does Montessori work the same? Hopefully this video might be able to help you out and give you a little bit of guidance as to, first of all, what's the difference? Uh, is it the same thing? Is a Montessori teacher a special ed teacher? We'll go over some of those questions. And also, uh, if you are doing homeschooling or if you are a, an educator, or if you're a parent that wants to know more about what your options are for your child in a Montessori setting, uh, I have a lot of helpful tools in here that might be able to show you uh, a little bit more about how to plan differently for children who have different needs. So with that being said, let's move forward. So what are the characteristics of Montessori? We know it's not public school, right? There are a lot of there are a lot of things that parents think about when they think about Montessori and maybe different educators have different opinions about Montessori because you've heard one thing or another. And I just want to state right now that Montessori did not copyright her name or her work. She did not do a copyright on that because she really wanted her method to be free. And that's why anybody and everybody can use the name Montessori and they're not accountable to anything. So you could literally open a doggy daycare and call it Montessori you'd be, I think you're legally able to do that because she did not copyright it. She wanted her philosophy, her methods to be usable by the public. And she didn't want to create an obstacle for using what she was trying to give the world. So with that being said, let's look a little bit at those characteristics of what Maria Montessori brought to education. So the Montessori method is of course, based on Dr. Montessori's work as a doctor and a psychologist. And this was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So she created, <laughs> and I wrote the word toys in here, if you're a Montessori educator, bear with me. Um, some of the textbooks, like when I was, before I ever got into Montessori, I was in early childhood education and my textbooks would say that she was famous for creating self-correcting toys. Um, that's not exactly what I would consider her, her contribution to education, but a lot of the times that's what's out there. But she did create self-correcting materials. Um, and, and if you listen to my videos, I talk a lot about the control of error. And I'm gonna ex explain more deeply the difference between this idea of self-correcting toys and what Maria Montessori was really doing with her method. But if you're a Montessori teacher and that kind of, uh, rubbed you the wrong way, don't worry. We'll, we'll get a little bit further into that um, later on. Anyways, she also focused a lot on real work, purposeful work rather than play, which, you know, a lot of times with play and fantasy, especially in that zero to age, zero to six age group, um, she really related that to unfulfilled desires. And she really wanted to be able to give children the opportunity to do real work. So instead of pretend baking, pretend, um, 
cleaning, she gave them opportunities to clean, to bake, to do all these things, to sew. And what she found out when she first started her classroom, she gave them all the toys and everything that we usually do, right? Like you would see in childcare. But then she discovered something. She discovered that when she gave the children real purposeful work to do, something different happened. All of a sudden, they spent more time concentrating with the toys, with the toys, she noticed that they would they would use the toys, but then they would get tossed aside pretty quickly. The novelty wore off. But when she gave them real work to do, the concentration deepened and that expanded their work cycle, ex- expanded their focus and the skills that they were um, working on in that age group. So anyways, that is a really important first concept of what is Montessori. She also was very, um, was known for creating a method that went from concrete to abstract, meaning that if I'm going to teach in the zero to six age group, the reason why, the reason why I can teach a four-year-old how to do uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with the golden beads into the thousands is because the work is very concrete. It's a very real. So they literally have like 2,845 beads, golden beads. And I can show them, oh, well, I can take that away or I can add more to it. I can multiply it and I can divide it. It's a very concrete. And as the child experiences that, They begin to master those concepts and they're ready to go on to work that's a little more abstract, that they don't need to have physically every single bead in their hand to understand the concept of quantity and the different types of operations. So that's another characteristic of Montessori. And here is another characteristic of Montessori. When you go to Montessori training, uh, and now I'm going to talk about the three to six training in AMI because that is what I'm trained in. So that's what I know. And when I went to training, I had five albums that I had to create. I had a theory album, I have a language album, I have a math album, I have a sensorial album, and I have a practical life album. Those are my five albums. Every single lesson I'm going to give a child, every single lesson is in that, in, in those albums, and they are in a progression. So I know exactly where to start, and I know where every single lesson ends. I know what comes before, I know what comes after. And so we have this idea that all these lessons in these albums are going to apply to each child as is, and they're going to apply to them equally. So I don't have to think up new lesson plans. All the lesson plans are included in my albums. Now, anybody who's taught in Montessori knows that when it comes to (laughs) biology, practical life, all of that stuff, history, you're still making up a lot of lessons, right? There's still a lot there that you have to create on a weekly, um, bi-weekly, and monthly basis. So it's not that we don't do lesson planning, but for the most part, for the main things, you're really talking about one lesson for each concept that applies equally to the children. Universal truths are upheld that apply to all children. So that is a lot of what Montessori focused on are these universal truths about how children learn and these are the lessons and the sequence of the lessons for them to master those universal truths of learning. So that is something else that you have to think about in terms of a Montessori education. So teachers are given a set curriculum to follow that have a series of progressive lessons and these lessons often have extensions in them. So if I'm giving a lesson on the numbers 1 to 10, there are smaller lessons that I give afterwards that are called extensions. And they just extend the material out, extend the experience with the material. And for the zero to six age group, especially with the three to six age group, we have what's called a sensorial impression. So before we even get into doing operations, addition, subtraction, uh, we'll give them, we will give the child a sensorial impression of those operations. And so they're they're actually doing an impression of those operations with other materials before they even get a formal lesson. Same thing with grammar. When we teach grammar in the uh, kindergarten age group, when I'm teaching about the article, the adjective, the noun, the verb, all of that, uh, we say we are giving the sensorial impression of grammar. We're not teaching it directly. We're giving that sensorial impression. 
And so a lot of those uh, extensions happen in earlier works. So we have the main lesson, the primary lesson with each work, and then we have extensions that allow the child to work with that uh, material a little bit longer. So the educator in AMI training learns how to present lessons to the ideal child. And this is where I really want you to focus in. When we go to training, we don't learn about giving lessons to a child that has, let's say, a deviation or a disability. Everything that we learn, every, every presentation we learn, is for the ideal child, for the child that is extremely well behaved, the child that's going to listen, the child that's never going to fidget, the child that's going to concentrate and do exactly what you tell them to do. That is how we learn our presentations when we go to teacher training in Montessori for AMI Montessori. So in our theory album, we'll learn about deviation and normalization. We'll learn about how a child does have deviations. But that is not who we are presenting our materials to when we're learning how to present the lessons. We're not taught how to adjust the curriculum to create lesson plans for any deviations and disabilities. And I think that's really important for parents to know that when we go through training, none of it is geared towards special education. None of, none of the, the presentations and the lessons that we learn to give are geared towards giving it to a child who will not receive the lesson. So I think that's a really important thing to understand before we get into talking about the characteristics of special education. And finally, uh, one characteristic of Montessori that I think a lot of Montessorians don't really realize is the concept of auto-education. And we do talk about this. We talk about independence. We talk about how the guide is just the link between the child and the material. We're just there to link the child to the material. And as soon as the child gets their hands on that material, they're going to auto-educate. And that the guide is very well aware of coming out of training. They do believe that, that, that that is exactly the theory. But what sometimes we miss in this is that that's for the ideal child. That auto education piece is for the ideal child. It's not for a child with disabilities and it's not for a child that is having deviations. So keep that in mind. We're gonna come back to that. So if you're thinking along the lines of, okay, well, what does that mean? Don't worry, we're gonna get into that more a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of special education. So in special education, you have an intense focus on the specific needs of children. You're not looking at a curriculum, a one size fits all curriculum that includes everybody, right? You are thinking to yourself, I need to be very, very, very specific. Whatever the curriculum is, doesn't matter if it's Montessori, doesn't matter if it's public school, I need to look at a child individually, I need to focus on their needs, I need to assess their needs, and I need to figure out how I can change whatever's going on to meet the child's needs. So that's one really important characteristic of special education. Another characteristic, lesson plans um, have to adapt to meet the needs of an individual child. Every special, special education teacher has to look at what they're given and say, this or that needs to change if I want this child to succeed with this lesson. So that's another thing that's different. Special education also has, or should, I guess I should say, it should have a team-oriented plan. It should be team-oriented because in order to implement whatever whatever's going on, they have to usually ask experts outside of themselves. One special education degree is not going to cover every single need that the special education teacher is going to is going to have along the way because everything is so specialized now. Right now, you can get a master's just in reading disabilities, right? You can get a specialization, a master's degree in ABA therapy, which is really applies to autism. And so there's all these intense specializations going on in a special education teacher a lot of times has the general knowledge, has a lot of general um, ideas. They really look at everything, but they're still going to need a team of people to help them out. So they're going to need experts in specific 
uh, specialties that have to be brought in and they need to educate the teacher, they need to educate the administration and what a specific child's needs are. So it really has to be this team appro approach of the family, the teacher, the administration, and whatever medical needs are needed outside of that, maybe the speech pathologist, maybe the occupational therapist, an entire team comes together to work for a child. In Montessori, however, it's usually just the guide and one or two assistants. So there isn't an, an idea of teamwork outside of the Montessori guide unless the administration and the school specifically commits to that idea. So again, with special education, they aren't focused on a specific curric curriculum. They're focused on working with any curriculum and adapting that cur curriculum for the child's needs, for unique for each child. And while the educator has a background in specific behaviors that deviate from normal behaviors in the classroom, and that's really the opposite of Montessori. Because in Montessori, we're really focused on the ideal child. That's what we look at when we go to training. We're looking at the ideal child. And you're going to find that when teachers get out of their AMI training, they go into their first classroom. It might be their first experience. And they have no idea what to do with a child with dyslexia. They don't know what to do with a child with Down syndrome. You know, none of that is in our training. And so it's not the same thing as special education because special education is looking at the not ideal child to teach, right? What's not easy about implementing these lessons here? Where's it gonna go wrong, right? They're looking at those exceptions and they're looking at children who have shown in both public school and private school that they have difficulty with auto education. They need an intervention. So what are some misconceptions about Montessori after we discussed all this? Okay, here's the misconception, one misconception I hear a lot. The Montessori method works perfectly the way it is without any changes or adaptations for children who have different needs. So this is a huge misconception, that's not true. And Montessori never said that auto-education worked with every child. So let's look at a little bit of the history of Montessori herself. She started out using specific te techniques with children who had disabilities. She was working in asylums. And she realized these techniques can also work with children who did not have disabilities. So the techniques she was using worked differently for children who did not have any disabilities. With those children, she realized she needed to move out of their way and let them auto-educate with the materials. And this was far more beneficial for those children than in sitting with them and doing more. She gave the presentation and moved out of the child's way, the child was interested in the work, the materials itself, and could find the purpose in the work without any extra interventions or help. So in those situations, the educator would become an obstacle if they did more than just simply present the material. And that's what we're taught in our AMI training. This is the ideal child right here. It is specifically different than how she worked with children in asylums when she was first starting out as a doctor. So this is very different, right? This is a misconception about Montessori and special education. And you will find as you go into more Montessori research, she never said that it was going to work perfectly as is for every child across the board equally. So another misconception about Montessori is your one year of training or three summers, or if you're like me, I did a two summer training. Um, that Montessori training, <laughs> is enough to teach children with and without disabilities. You have everything you need, even if your background was human resources before you went to training and got your Montessori training and became a teacher. Everything you need is in those five albums and you should never have to deviate with it, uh, deviate from it, and it's perfectly fine to implement it the way it is for all children without having to make any adaptations to anything. That's a misconception. And I know a lot of people who came to Montessori, who came to teaching without having any background in education, without having any experience in education. Um, they did graphic design, they did human resources, they did all these different things. They were 
in history or fine arts. And those are great things to have a background in before you go into teaching. However, a lot of the misconception comes from um, when you just get out of the teaching, you think that you have everything you need to handle any child. And that's a misconception. You only have one year of training. It's basically one full year of training. That's not enough training to meet every child's needs. You do, you do not come out of that training knowing how to handle everything you're going to handle in a classroom. Like I said before, that one year of training, or as it equals out into two or three summers, is enough for you to understand how to present to the ideal child. The rest of your career is going to be spent figuring out how to help the child that is not ideal. That's usually maybe two or three of my students each year are the ideal students. <laughs> and the rest of them I have to figure out in different areas what I'm going to do. So this is a, a very common misconception in the Montessori community itself. That one year of training is enough for you to handle everything. It's not true. Uh, another misconception is um, Montessori is just so different from a traditional school that it will work for children with disabilities simply because it is different. And I'm not going to say that's not true, but I can't say that it's true either. You might get very lucky. Your child might have maybe a mild disability and you might get placed in a room with a teacher who just really works with whatever that child is struggling with really well. And it might be beautiful. It might work. It might be exactly what they need. Like, for instance, I'm uh, trained in Orton Gillingham. I have a lot of experience with working with children with dyslexia. And that's something that I really understand. And so if a child comes into my classroom, that's something I really know how to work with pretty well. And I don't really, um, it's not a huge mystery for me. Not every teacher has that training. So you could get a teacher in Montessori that meets the, your child's needs, as is. Um, but just because it's different doesn't mean it is a substitute for special education. I think that um, if you do get into a situation where it works out, you're probably very lucky. Uh, but it should not be guaranteed that that will work for you. So Montessori, another, the last misconception I want to cover is Montessori guaranteed children with disabilities could learn the same as those without. So this is false. She never guaranteed that. Uh, Montessori used auto education for children who did not have disabilities. And if you do further research, you will see that she even affirmed that schools dedicated to specific disabilities could still be needed. And her work was based on techniques that originated from schools that focused on children with disabilities, children who are isolated, like in the deaf-mute community. But, but she did not use those techniques in the same context as children who were following that path of auto-education. So that's a common misconception that it works the same no matter what which is not true uh, we have to keep in mind that the ami trained teacher has about one year of training and it's an intense training it's a hard training and i love it and i've learned a lot but maria montessori herself was a doctor she was a psychologist she had a passion for engineering and i want you to keep that in mind that this medical model that Maria Montessori was very involved in is not medical anymore in Montessori. People who come into the Montessori program usually don't have a medical background. However, that is changing, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that later on when I go into what resources are available for people. So Montessori and special education sometimes get wrapped together because there are some unique things about Montessori. They also have a shared history. So that is another reason why Montessori and special education are complementary. And I want to say that they're complementary, but they are not the same thing. They, you cannot substitute Montessori for special education. So where did it start? Where did they start to branch out? So we got to go back into history just a little bit. And when you go to AMI training, you get your educator's timeline and you learn about all this history. You learn about where Montessori came from and how she developed her ideas. So Montessori's work with special education and 
the word special education, it wasn't around back then. So I'm just using that word now because that's the context that we would understand it in. But that's not something that existed in her time. So she worked in asylums before she started, um, before starting a school for young children, the three to six, the three to six age group. And that was her first school was in the three to six age group. And so she had a lot of experience taking care of children, taking care of children in these asylums who were thought unable to learn. And because she is a very studious woman, she was very studious for her time and she studied just about everything. She went back into history and she found people and techniques that worked for children, especially in the deaf mute community. And she looked at techniques that people were using uh, at the time that seemed to be very profound and showing promise that children who were once thought not able to learn actually could learn. So her experience with children with disabilities showed they were able to learn. But the method taught in AMI training currently is for auto education, not special education. Maria Montessori applied her special education techniques to children without disabilities and discovered that they could auto educate with these methods. So yes, there is a history of special education in Montessori's work, but we also have to remember she had an entirely different education before she became an educator as well. And it's that medical model and special education has a lot of um, medical background in it. So it's, it's, got that overlap. You have this complementary system here, and there's a lot of things in special education of her time that could be said of special education in her time that applied to children without disabilities, but it's not the same context. So Maria Montessori ushered in, ushered in a new area, era for educational psychology to create practical applications. She used the scientific method, and this is really important, and this is another reason why it's very complementary to special education. She really focused on educational psychology, which was not a thing back then. She was part of that movement to say, psychology is great. Studying psychology is great, but we're not going to create practical applications. It's not very meaningful and she so she so she invited people to think about how to create practical applications from the study of psychology through using the scientific me method and to do that she really had to go back and looked at and look at people who are doing the same thing and if you were to look at the intellectual genealogy of Montessori in her work and this is according to E.M. Standing, who wrote a book on Maria Montessori's life and work. Um, the intellectual genealogy for Montessori is based on Pereire, Sagan, and Etard, and their work with the deaf community. And if you don't know who those people are, don't worry, because I'm going to give you a little bit of a tutorial right now. So Pereire uh, lived from 1715 to 1780. And he is cre credited for, develop for the development of sign language in correlation to sound instead of letter or symbol. He developed lip reading and articulation of speech for the deaf. So that's a pretty big thing right there. And Dr. Montessori began her work with children in insane asylums and used the methods of Etard, Sagan, and Pereri to establish the foundations of her educational theories. So right there, we see some overlap into the history of special education. And then Etard, um, Etard's one of my favorites to study because you can watch the movie, uh, The Wild Child, Victor of Aberon, uh, and that's what's in the background of this picture here. So Etard lived from 17, 1775 to 1838, and he was the first to attempt a methodical education of the sense of hearing. And he worked at the Deaf Mute Institute started by Pereri in Paris. So there's a link between Pereri and Etard right here. Now he had a medical background and he was able to restore hearing in the partially deaf. And he became known as the founder of otology. And Montessori considers Etard the founder of scientific education and is the founder, founda and is the found, which is the foundation for the Montessori method. So the scientific 
education. That is, that is a really important concept. And then there's Sagan, and Sagan is credited with having perfected a real educational system for defective children. And I know that word defective sounds a little harsh, harsh, but that's the direct quote. So I'm going to keep it in there, but just keep in mind, that's the language at the time. We don't use that nowadays. And Sagan began, began his career as a teacher and later became a physician. So he did the opposite of Montessori. Montessori started out as a physician and became an educator and educated children from insane asylums and used an analytical method to teach. He called his method the physiological method of education and emphasized that education has always had psychology as its foundation. So there you go, uh, the foundation of psychology and education. These two were not put together necessarily throughout history. They were two separate things. There was education, there was psychology. And then they started being put together. And then Maria Montessori uh, invited people to think of practical applications based on educational psychology. So there's a little bit of a transformation there between having two separate fields come together and then create application. And Sagan declared that the physiological and psychological methods he used could also be applied to quote unquote normal children. So here again, we see that the application started with children who had a disability and then were applied to children who did not have a disability. So Montessori used Sagan's three period lesson. And if you don't know what that is, I have a video on the three period lesson on uh, on my YouTube channel, so look for that. Montessori used Sagan's three period lesson in her education method and declared that going out into the world requires a preparation and that Sagan erected a whole system of education on this concept of a preparation for going out into the world. Now, you can also relate this a little bit to special education too, because life skills are really at the heart of special education. We're not just preparing them academically, we're also preparing them for going out into the world. And sometimes when we're looking at children with special needs, the most important thing is how to help the children go out into the world versus getting all these academic boxes, boxes checked when you graduate from high school, right? So. There's a little bit of um, an insight into how Montessori and special education are complementary. Like Montessori, Sagan believed that the object of the science of education should, not, should be not only to observe, but also to transform children. So this observation and this transformation has to take place. Both Sagan and Montessori believed that Educational psychology should be scientific and applicable. There's that word applicable again. It has an obligation to impact teaching in a progressive, accessible, and functional way. And that is really key right there. As a, both a Montessori teacher and a special education teacher, right? If you're, whichever way you're looking at this, that's going to change things right there. We have an obligation to impact teaching in a progressive, accessible, accessible and functional way. What happens when the lessons in your album and how you're presenting them are not progressive, accessible, or functional to the child you're working with? What do you do? If you're a Montessori teacher, is your album the way it is and the way you were trained to deal with the ideal child, is that going to work? And I dare say the answer to that is no. We need to adapt. We need to change. So Maria Montessori, 1870 to 1952. So this is the time period she was working in. The four areas of Montessori education that had been most out of, out, out of step with the theories of the early 1900s involved the Montessori involved Montessori's emphasis on intellectual or cognitive development, sensory training the sensitive periods of the child's growth, and the child's spontaneous interest in learning. So there's some key points of Maria Montessori right there. Do you see some overlap into special education with that, like the sensory training, sensitive periods, spontaneous interest in learning, any of those? Particularly the cognitive development, right? 
Montessori believed that the child must have certain conditions in his environment or he will not develop normally. And further, when periods of disruptive behavior occur, it is because the child is trying to tell us that some great need of his is not being met. If you're a Montessori teacher, can you relate to that? The child is trying to tell us that some great need of his is not being met. So if you are presenting your lesson to the ideal child who is not uh, auto-educating, right? You're presenting this to the concept of the idea child who can't auto-educate to the child that is having a disruptive behavior. What does that mean? Does that mean that Montessori doesn't work? No, it means that a need is not being met. And if a need is not being met, that means we have to do something different. And this is where we get into a little bit of trouble in Montessori when we're not special education teachers. We don't know how to meet the need of that child. That doesn't mean that child doesn't belong in the classroom. But when you realize that you don't, need, you don't know how to meet the need of the child in your classroom, it means you have to have resources. It means you have to do something different. It means that you have to get something or somebody outside of yourself to help you figure out what is this child's need. Because continually preparing lessons the way that you're preparing them and implementing the way you've implemented them is not going to be what brings the child around. If they have a disability, and you're not changing how you're, you're relating to that child, then you're not going to meet their needs. So we have to change. We have to figure out what's going on within the child that's not being met. And that's where Montessori, the way it is now, the way you go through training and special education start differing. That doesn't mean that Montessori can't meet the, meet the needs of the child. But often it means that we don't know how. We don't have the training or the knowledge or, or the expertise or the specialty in something that the child needs. And we need to go outside of ourselves and bring it into the classroom. And that's where I, I think it's important for people to look at special education, to look at something as special as occupational therapy, as speech pathology. Those things are very specialized. Also included in this could be ABA therapy. ABA therapy, and that we have to learn from others, but it requires getting more, educa more education, more experience, more resources. And this is why in the Montessori environment, if a child is struggling and we're not meeting that need, it's because often we don't have the knowledge or the resources to identify the child's need and create that practical application to fulfill their need. So... That's a little bit of the difference between uh, Montessori and special education right there. So let's look at some examples of special education and Montessori working together comp in a complementary way. So if you are a Montessori teacher, uh, one of the things that you could do to help adapt for a special education need is changing the environment and lesson plans for a child with cognitive impairment. Let's take that as an example. First of all, one of the things that you may need to do is change your goals. This is a great place to start because you might be able to do enough as is by just changing your goals. For instance, perhaps a child with a cognitive impairment in the three to six age group, uh, maybe your goal for them in the primary environment is that they learn the letters in their name, right? And learn how to spell their name by the time they get to first grade. Instead of fluently reading and writing or giving the sensorial impression of grammar by the time they go to first grade, maybe that's not your goal. Maybe your goal is to say, this child needs to be able to, be able to identify their name before they go to first grade. So that's one cha change of goal you could do. Perhaps another goal is the fact that uh, the child maybe isn't going to learn do we learn operations up into the thousands and the millions by the time they go to first grade? Maybe instead, your goal is they need to learn one through 10. That's it, keeping it that simple. And instead of teaching one through 10 all at the same time, we do one through three with the number rods. Then we do one through three with the spindle boxes. And then we do one through three with numbers and counters. And then we can go back 
and do four, five, and six through all of those, right? Maybe we progress differently through the materials. That could be a different way to change the environment, change or adapt the materials, adapt the lessons. Perhaps instead of focusing on academic skills, what you really need to focus on for a child with cognitive impairments are the self-help skills. And maybe these are emphasized more than academic skills. And you're going to need probably some help in identifying that. If the self-help skills are not there, you're probably going to need to work with an occupational therapist to do that. And then, of course, you need to create new materials. And this is the hard part. New materials will probably have to be created based on what works for the child with a specific disability. Let's say Down syndrome, right? Uh, Down syndrome has, you have some cognitive impairment as well as physical difficulties. You're gonna have to keep both of those in your, in your consideration when you introduce a work to them. How are they gonna pick up this work? How are they gonna carry this work? How are, how are they gonna put this work back? Right? There's a lot of things you have to keep in mind. What's their posture going to be like as they work with this? This is something that an occupational therapist can help you evaluate. So proven methods should be researched and used to help that child with a specific diagnosis. There are specific things that can help children with autism. There are specific proven methods that can help children with Down syndrome. You're going to have to research what those needs are, what has worked best for them, and implement it into the Montessori curriculum. So another thing that you can do is create materials to fill uh, a need for specific children that kind of bridge a gap between two works. So new material can be created to help a child transition between mastering one concept and being presented with a new concept. So maybe the child loves butterflies they are not interested in number rods. They are not interested in spindle boxes. Can you use butterflies instead of wooden spindles? Yeah, you can. Can you use red butterflies with the number rods and blue butterflies with the number rods so that there's an identification? Maybe, maybe there's something there, right? You're going to have to think outside the box. And yes, I understand if you're a Montessori teacher, you don't want to turn that into a toy. You don't want one of your third years coming along and saying, ooh, butterflies, I want to play with that. And yet maybe that older child needs to be working on um, the division board. But they really want to play with those butterflies. It's really, really ha hard to get that balance between what that child with a specific need uh, has to do to get mastery over a concept and what is going to create normalization in the classroom without other children becoming silly with the material, right? That's a huge balance in Montessori. We don't have a lot of things that children should be sitting down and just playing with. So when you do have to create materials, you do have to bring in different materials and change things up just a little bit, you're going to have to set boundaries. And that's kind of difficult to do. <laughs> and I understand people who are reluctant to do that because it can become distracting for the environment. And so you just have to keep trying, trying different things that can help both the child with a specific need and the classroom as a whole. So something to keep in mind uh, for working in Montessori with a child with specific needs um, that they can't auto-educate, right? So you're going to show them a lesson. They're never going to go back to it. They're not going to choose it. And if they do choose it, they might play with it and they're not going to use it purposefully, right? They might use the number rods as a sword. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to need to spend extra time and resources and that has to be provided. And you have to attend to that child daily with one-on-one -on -one lessons. It is not going to be simply present it and then the child's going to go back to it. You're going to have to lead them back to it. You're probably going to have to sit with them quite a bit. And to a Montessori teacher, that is very difficult. That takes up a lot of time and a lot of resources within the classroom. And this is where administration really needs to come in and have a vision for how this is going to work. Because if other children in the classroom stop getting lessons because you're spending all your time with a child who has a who has special needs and can't auto-educate, then the rest of the classroom becomes distracted, right? Your normalization does not happen. And this is something that 
administrators really need to get a better handle on. There's a lot of, there are a lot of uh, administrators who understand this concept, but goodness, there are a lot of administrators that do not understand this. A child with disabilities does not auto-educate. You're going to have to spend a lot more time and a lot more resources accomplishing the same goals for them as a child who can, uh, as opposed to a child who can auto-educate. So that's just a fact of the matter, right? So how much of your day are you going to be able to spend doing those extra lessons and creating those extra resources? And that's really, you can only do so much as a teacher other than say, okay, I'll do my best. Really administration, this is something administration really needs to focus on and have a good vision for it before they start filling up classrooms with um, many, many children who have very specific needs which happens a lot in Montessori because people look at Montessori and they say, you know what, that could work in, in place of special education. I don't want my child to be isolated in special education. I want them to have an inclusive education. And that's great. In Montessori, we welcome that. We want to have that in there. But we do need to sit, set our boundaries and say, I'm not a special education teacher. Um, and a lot of the times I'm working at a one to 15 ratio or a one to 18 ratio. And if the assistant does nothing more than than sit in a chair and observe all day long, then really you're at a, like a one to 30 ratio. So, it, and that does happen in Montessori. In Montessori, we really want to have a guide, one guide to about 30 children. And the, assist, the assistant is really in the observation chair observing and at best redirecting, right? They're just picking up those little pieces between what a child can't do and what the guide doesn't have time to do. They're not there to interact with the children very much. So that's a little bit of, of a difference between special education and Montessori. In Montessori, we're working at this one to 30 ratio. That's our goal is a one to 30 ratio, independent children working, special education. You're really working on one to one in small group. So that's another difference, right? So another thing, um, to look at is occupational and speech pathologists need to be brought in. They need to help the educator develop lesson plans and identify needs unique to each child. You have to create a team atmosphere. And if your school, and again, this starts with administration, if administration has no interest in building teams of people that help children, they are not going to meet the needs of children with disabilities. Because one year of Montessori training is not enough to be a special educator, a special education teacher. And even if you were a special education teacher, a one to 30 ratio is not going to work very well. And you're not going to be able to have every single um, need met, even if you do have a special education degree, right? There are things that an occupational therapist and a speech pathologist know that a special education teacher does not know. And so you still need them to help you out. Uh, and those are two of my favorite people to work with, our, our occupational therapists and speech pathologists. So my two favorite people. If I could have them on staff at a school 24 seven, I'd probably be the happiest educator in the world. That is a luxury that not many schools have. Also, you're going to have to bring in a pair pro because the assistant is there to basically redirect. The assistant can't be the pair pro. So a pair pro in a Montessori environment may need to be hired by the school, by the family, or by the school district to come in and help a child depending on the severity of their needs and to help them with their self-help school skills and to help them get through their daily work cycle. And again, that team needs to be built with the family, administration, educator, specialists, and they all need to meet on a regular basis to implement new plans and review, uh, review goals and review anything that the child has done and to mark progress. So this is where Montessori and special education can work together. We can change our goals, we can create new materials, and we can work with a team of people that gets us more information about how to meet a child's needs within the environment. So if you're looking at this and you're feeling overwhelmed and you're thinking, where do I even start? Especially if you're a Montessori teacher or if you're a homeschool parent that's just dealing with a lot right now. One of the, one of the things that I had to create in my special education class um, for my master's degree 
was this chart. And I think that's actually two pages. So I'll show you the second page in just a second. But across the top in blue, uh, these are all of the disabilities that um, my chart is working with. So you'll see speech delay and speech disabilities, language delay, language disabilities, specific learning disabilities, uh, ADD, ADHD, hyperactivity, all of that. Um, physical or health disability, emotional, behavioral disabil disabilities, autism, and sensory processing disorders, and intellectual um, disabilities, and um, the twice gifted, twice exceptional. So that's just um, a term for gifted children. So there's the different categories. And so maybe this is something you might want to work on if you're an educator and you're trying to figure out, well, how do I do this? How do I implement this? Or if you're a homeschool parent and you're thinking, I'm seeing a lot of stuff going on with my children. I need to start figuring out what's going on here. Make this chart. Start looking at the different things um, that you're kind of wanting to research first. And then in the green, you're going to ask yourself some questions to fill in here. You're going to say, okay, well, what, what are the characteristics of this? You know, if you're looking at um, your classroom or if you're looking at your homeschool environment and you're saying, I think I'm seeing a lot of ADHD, a lot of hyperactivity. So first of all, what are the characteristics? So you're going to need to do some research on that. And the next question you want to ask is what might you observe at your level? So what age group are you looking at? Like if, for instance, my age group is at three to six years old, then what might I see with an, a child with hyperactivity? Well, that one's pretty observable, right? They're not going to be able to focus on anything. They're going to probably distract other people. And instead of choosing a work, they're probably going to focus on distracting other people's work, right? If I give them a work to do and they're doing it, but everything is so disorganized, uh, that might be something you observe too, right? And then some critical questions. And critical questions could include, and this is one I want you to always in include when you're thinking about what a child is going through, especially if you're an educator. If you're a parent, you probably know, but uh, if you're an educator, one critical question might be, has the child experienced trauma? And for example, if you look at what's went on with Uvalde, those children experienced trauma. Now that school, I believe, has been shut down, right? They're not going to go back to that school. They're going to all go to different schools now. And so if a teacher is going to get one of those children into their classroom next year, they might look at that child and, and think, oh, I think I see some, some disabilities going on here. Why hasn't the child, this child been, been flagged for a disability? And you all have to stop and ask yourself also, uh, well, what, what trauma has this child experienced? Because it could be that there is a disability there, but it also could be that a child is exhibiting what looks like a disability when really it could be trauma. And so you need to think about that too. Think about whether or not, you know, if you have a child in your classroom that, that isn't concentrating, that doesn't seem to be reading, they seem really inconsistent with what they're learning, but you also just found out that they had a death in the family, maybe they don't have a disability. Maybe there's something else going on. So I want you to keep that in mind. So another question you might ask is, how do they transition from one activity to the next? How do they transition from um, one event or like from inside to outside activities, how do they do, how do they deal with social interactions? Uh, if you're thinking about autism, uh, can, do they make eye contact? How do they communicate with, uh, with adults or other children? So for instance, um, one of my students who had autism, he used to come in uh, at the beginning of, of the year when I first was getting to know him, he used to come in and say, I'm sorry I woke up today, Miss Teresa. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that's all right. That's okay. And it was, it, it was an unusual phrase, right? And he kept on saying, I'm sorry I woke up today, Miss Teresa. And eventually I came to learn that what he was saying is, I'm tired and I didn't want to get out of bed. But the phrase, phrasing was different, right? In his mind, it made sense to say, I'm sorry I didn't want to get up today. So there's a little bit of different different things that go on with children with autism. You're going to find some some different wording, some different way of thinking about things and how they communicate things. There'll be something a little different to that sometimes. So there's different critical questions that you can ask. So if you're going to make a chart like this, start start by making that. 
And then there's a few more questions I want you to ask yourself. And for me, the question is what to do? What Montessori supports do I have inside the classroom? So if I have a child with, uh, let's say ADHD, some of the Montessori supports I have within the classroom are the fact that I don't have a specific schedule. I have a three hour work cycle. And that really leaves me flexible to understand a child with hyperactivity. When do they need the most activity? When do they need more physical activity? You're going to want to keep those lessons really short, right? 10 to 15 minutes. And usually you want to do those lesson, lessons at the beginning of the day when they have the most con concentration. And so making a work cycle that is tailored to that child's needs is very easy to do in the Montessori environment right? We don't do everything as one big class. I can tailor his schedule for his needs. And I can also make sure that the time I give those lessons are the times that fit best for his concentration level. And I can also make sure that if he needs big muscle work, such as let's say scrubbing the floor or woodworking, there's time for him to do that when his body needs that most. There's usually a lot of flexibility in the Montessori environment. So right here when it says what to do, what Montessori supports you have, I want you to think about, well, what do I have available in my environment? What power, what control do I have over my environment to be able to change things so this child's needs are met um, differently than what they're being met now? And the second, the next question for this page is interventions and accommodations from special education. Okay, so this is where you're going to start looking outside yourself. This is where you're going to start saying, okay, well, I have a child with ADHD. What do I need to do? Well, first of all, you might want to talk to your pediatrician, right? You want to, might want to schedule something with the occupational therapist, see if there are also some sensory issues going on that um, might also help with his concentration if we deal with the sensory issues, because a lot of times there's a lot of overlap between ADHD and sensory. You can see a lot, usually a lot going on with both. And so you're gonna start looking outside yourself, outside your environment. So your next question to ask is, well, where can I get some more information? Where can I get some more help? So that's the next question to ask. Now, if you're doing homeschooling, this next part doesn't really apply unless you really want it to. Um, what kind of plan? Do you need an I, IEP, ISP? You know, do you need a medical plan? Do you need uh, a plan with your school district? You might not, right? So here we are at the resources for parents and teachers. So this is where I'm gonna give you some information about where you can get more training, where you can get more information. And the first one on the list is MMPI, which is a training I just went through. So that's the um, Montessori Medical Partnership for Inclusion. And I just took their class, their year long class on fundamentals for Montessori, of Montessori inclusion for elementary. I took that class, it was about a year long and it's all about inclusion. And I'm gonna show you each of these before I end this video. So I'll show you what the website looks like for this. Uh, another type of training you can do is go to the AMI uh, website and look for training specifically for inclusion because a lot of training centers are really getting into that. And then there's, of course, uh, because my specialty is more in dyslexia training, uh, I went through the Michigan Dyslexia Institute. I am Orton Gillingham trained. And if you're going to do Orton Gillingham, I really recommend the 60 hour training or more. Uh, so I am already trained in Orton Gillingham through the Michigan Dys Dyslexia Institute and Central Mich Michigan University. And it was a semester long with a teaching internship. So it was a pretty intense training. And this summer, I'm actually going to take um, another course in Orton Gillingham. It's the OG Plus course from the um, Bowman Educational S Services started by uh, Fran Bowman. And Stephanie Pratt is now teaching that class. So that is where I would go for dyslexia training. That's a great place to start. The next thing I would do is look at some different schools. Some of the schools to observe or get training from. Um, and, and the first one, if you really want to get training, and this is good for AMS or AMI teachers, this is not just talking to AMI teachers here, is the Shelton School. And that is, um, I believe, Joyce Pickering School. And there are, there's I listed all the different trainings, some of the different trainings they have there. They have a ton of, of special education type, inclusion type training there. Just a wealth of training at the Shelton School. So that's another program that you can look at. I think they also have um, 
I think they're also a school that has actual, um, where they teach children as well. They don't just train teachers, I think. Um, one school that's on my radar that I would like to observe someday is called Elizabeth Academy. And I learned about Elizabeth Academy through my special education class uh, from Loyola because Elizabeth Academy was started by a parent whose daughter, daughter had Down syndrome and they wanted to get her into a Montessori school. And they did this trial period at the Montessori school and they said, you know what, it's just not a good fit. We don't think we're going to be able to take her. And so from that experience, that parent who really wanted something different for their child, really wanted to meet the needs of her child without her going into special education, without her going into public school, she started a Montessori school, and that's Elizabeth Academy. And at Elizabeth, Elizabeth Academy, it's a Montessori school that is really dedicated to special education, special needs. And they have a lot of resources there. They have... Um, occupational therapists and speech pathologists and Montessori teachers all working together, all these different specializations together at one school. And it's something um, I haven't been able to see yet. I've been able to hear uh, the founder of that school speak. Um, and she spoke to my MMPI class uh, last year. And it was really very, very touching, very moving. So Elizabeth Academy over in Utah uh, is on my radar. I would love to observe them um, at some point in time. So different books that you can get that I, I have found very helpful is Your Child's Growing Mind by Jane M. Healy. That's a wonderful book. It's not a Montessori book. Um, she is an educational psychologist, I believe, and she really writes with parents in mind. So her books are excellent for how to meet your child's needs in different ways. Joyce Pickering um, wrote a book called Montessori Strategies for Children with Learning Differences, the MACGAR model. Uh, and that is the textbook actually that I had to have for my MMPI class. It's excellent. And Fran Bauman um, actually wrote a book called the Orton Gillingham Plus Guidebook. So if you're interested in Orton Gillingham, that might be a helpful book right there. Uh, so that is what I have for the presentation part, but I did want to show you real quick before I end it, the different uh, different places you can go on the internet. So right here is the MMPI, the Montessori Medical Partnership for Inclusion website. Their goal is to really bring that medical element of Montessori back into the educational realm so that they partner again, just like they did when Montessori was creating her method. It was really, really uh, started from that medical model and then she put education on top of it. And it's, those two worlds have been separated since then. There's not a whole lot of medical anything going on in our AMI training, other than we understand that there's a lot of brain-based learning going on. So trying to bring back that medical model into Montessori has been a really great thing. Um, and here is, let's take a look at their upcoming inclusion events. They've got one. Oh, and they're also uh, starting a Montessori therapy certification program. Um, you will have to travel to Germany for it a little bit when they bring it over. Um, this is the class I took, Foundations of Montessori Inclusion in Elementary. That's the class I just finished. And um, they have a different workshop on occupational therapy. Um, the OT in Montessori. This is what I want to take, but they've delayed it, and I'm busy taking my OG Plus class for this summer, so I can't afford another one. But um, this is a class that I really would love to take. Uh, Barbara Laborski, I had her in my MMPI class that I just finished. She is fantastic. I highly recommend her. If you get to listen to her speak or get to um, have her consult, highly recommend her. She's absolutely fabulous and is very familiar with the Montessori environment. So really wonderful resource right there. So there's a lot of great things on this website at montessoriforinclusion.org. So I absolutely look into that if you're interested. Uh, you can also go to the montessoriami.org website and you can go under their training. And under their training, there's going to be a lot of different training programs going on. And some of them um, are just the regular training, but a lot of the places um, a lot of the different training centers are now offering inclusion programs. When I was going to the Montessori Institute of San Diego, uh, uh, Dr. Dubois was just starting to launch that inclusion program. And 
I don't know what's happened since COVID. Everything has changed. Don't know if they still have it, but um, Dr. Dubois is wonderful when it comes to uh, psychology topics. So if you ever get to listen to one of her talks, it's absolutely wonderful. So let's see, Michigan Dyslexia Institute. That is where I got my original Orton Gillingham training. Highly recommend Michigan Dyslexia Institute. They do partner with Orton Gillingham training. So that is wonderful. And this is the Academy of Orton Gillingham right here. So there you go. There's their website if you want to learn a little bit more. Again, I highly recommend that 60 hours of training, including um, the student teaching element. Very important. So there is that. Oh, and this is the Shelton School right here. And the Shelton School has a lot of training. Let's look at training and materials. So they have their, they have their, they have so many different trainings and I'll have to be, admit that um, they really have so many, I get overwhelmed. <laughs> um, so they have a lot of different things that can prepare you for different types of inclusion training. So this is something to look into. I, they are based in Texas, I believe. Right now they're doing a lot of stuff virtually, but they may go back to on-ground training. There's the Shelton School. Oh, I have the Shelton School up several times. And as far as books are concerned, if you're interested in Montessori and inclusion, Joyce Pickering, who I also got to hear speak through my MMPI class. She's absolutely wonderful. Anytime you get to listen to her speak, absolutely fantastic. And she literally wrote the book, Montessori Strategies for Children with Learning Differences. I have this book. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, if you're a Montessori educator, Montessori parent, and you're interested in this stuff, uh, this is definitely worth a buy. And this is a, a book that I'm really, uh, that I have bought several times actually in it and told people to put in their library. Uh, I absolutely love Jane M. Healy's writings. I love her books. Your Child's Growing Mind is fantastic. It really covers a lot of different topics. So it doesn't just focus on one specific disability, but it also helps parents. Uh, she helps parents ask questions, think about questions to ask their um, educational institutes how to be an advocate for your child, what works best for children with these specific learning disabilities. So it's really just a comprehensive um, book when you're looking at diving into different special education topics. And it's really very much written with parents in mind. It's parent friendly. So it's not just a bunch of stuff for educators. It really is a parent friendly book right there. So those are all the resources I would suggest for you. I hope that you have learned something valuable from this discussion today. I know it was a really long topic, but it's something I'm really passionate about. It's something I'm interested in talking more about. And I would love to get some guest speaker, speakers on someday. Keep my fingers crossed and I hope that that will happen. If you like what I'm doing here, if you liked what I said today, please give this video a thumbs up. Also, comment below. It helps if you comment. I really would love to have a conversation, a dialogue with you. So if you're watching this and you made it to the end, uh, make sure to comment and I will be sure to respond. I really want to know what you guys think or what questions you have. And then, of course, as always, share this video with others who might find it helpful and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you in the next video.